to join us um, uh, tonight. Um, and when we talked about um, the format, um, it seemed like a conversation uh, as opposed to a loud, boisterous uh, performance uh, was called for because the art of conversation, um, uh, we feel, is, is all but lost. But maybe it's lost already. Maybe, maybe in fact, we will evidence that tonight. Uh, too, much, too much gadgetry. Yes, exactly. Too much gadgetry. Um, so then we were think the next thing is a title, of course. And so um, uh, Dr. Davis cited um, uh, uh, one of her um, guiding icons, Hedy Lamar, with the title, uh, No One Leaves Delilah. Uh, and then I uh, post the colon. See, there's No One Leaves Delilah, and there's a colon, uh, a, a grammatical colon. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and um, and then the, the so the subtitle is a rap on race um, and uh, rap is with a W in parentheses because um, we were thinking of being swaddled uh, in turbans but th we decided again after the hurricane everything changed obviously because we're living in biblical end times um, but my reference for rap on race was a 1971 conversation between James Baldwin and Margaret Mead um, that was a, um, recorded on a primitive tape recorder, uh, a non-digital apparatus, and transcribed into a book. Um, uh, Baldwin and Mead, of course, are figures that um, we uh, uh, have great fondness for. Uh, they, like the two of us are from the 20th century. Um, and they were uh, uh, important, iconic figures, of course, but they were also always uh, shrouded in a kind of uh, mist, if you will, of inappropriateness, self-importance, and just a grifteriness to them, right, which we uh, very much admire. And so we were thinking of, uh, of rap on race um, as a kind of... Um, not so much a model, but a riff uh, for us. And then I, um, always being the intrepid researcher, I um, um, uh, looked up the uh, New York Times book review for that volume, uh, that 1971 volume, uh, which was really generally panned as awful, right? It was just about their celebrity, and they were totally talking out of their asses, and it was great, <laughs> right? So we were very um, impressed with that. So the first uh, uh, few lines of the book review, um, it's, 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 it's a, the New York Times is a propaganda sheet um, that's published in this city. And it, it's often known for very shrill reviews. And so this one's a gem. So I'll, I'll read a few lines, if you'll indulge me. Um, you don't need to revise, rethink, or rewrite you don't even need to write. Just think of it, folks. No more bloodshot eyes or coffee bowels or angry friends who stood up to work a little longer, harder, more. Sealed inside your own angry mortal human vacuum to be just as fatuous as Margaret Mead and James Baldwin about the crises of our time, particularly race. All you have to do is not listen, always avoid expressing your feelings openly, refer constantly to other times and other cultures with historical or pseudo-historical truths, interpret whatever possible, call yourself a prophet or a poet, insist that you are being emotionally sincere and or objectively rational, and record it all on tape to be transcribed later in a book. So maybe one day this will be a book as well, <laughs> in that spirit. So, you know, in the spirit of, uh, um, of uh, Baldwin and Mead and their fatuous uh, conversation, uh, we're here today. Um, and so, Dr. Davis, would you like to say anything before I begin um, with some questions I have? Um, well, um, in the spirit of James Baldwin and Margaret Mead, I think it's very appropriate um, to uh, read this little text that I wrote and a uh,
Okay, here we go. First of all, I must apologize in all sincerity to everyone gathered here tonight. You've all been brought here under false pretenses. <laughs> what I am about to reveal to you here at NYU's Hallowed Performance Studies Studio, <laughs> I know you are all going to find this very hard to believe. And some of you will be quite shocked by this revelation, but I fear that I must take the risk, even though my sanity and perhaps my very safety in the United States is probably in jeopardy. In good conscience, I can no longer continue to live a lie. I must tell you the truth, and nothing but the gospel truth, despite the dire consequences, and I can only pray to God, Jehovah of armies, that you can forgive me for having led you astray for so many years, letting you go on thinking I was something that I am not, and could never be. I want to use this occasion to celebrate my true self. I feel that the time is ripe for me to now shout from the highest mountaintop that I am indeed, yes, really, truly, <laughs> Did you hear me the first time? I am black. Yes, it's true. I'll give you a moment to let it sink in. <laughs> Go ahead. Lesbian process amongst the sex. <laughs> Of Deutsch and Yiddish, a Schwarze. <laughs> For those of you who are politically correct, an African American, a Negress, Jubus Jubilea, a Jigaboo, Piccaninny, a Tar Baby. A neglect, a spade, a spear chuckress, a hot and totten, a Jemima, a samba, a coon, a spook, a jungle bunny, a nigger, and a porch monkey. Thank you. Well, thank you for addressing the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, that was really important, thank you. And so, I think, in the spirit of that um, bold disclosure, um, I wanted to um, maybe ask you about your current situation as an expatriate in the tradition of many African-American sexual outsiders. Uh, but unlike Baldwin, you are not in lovely Paris you are in cold, chilly, Teutonic Berlin. Um, so can you talk about your life as an expatriate uh, in Berlin uh, and how it has affected your art practice and the things you do? Well, um, I've been going back and I've been going back and forth from Los Angeles, where I was born and raised. One of the few people that actually born and raised in Los Angeles, because everyone comes to Los Angeles from someplace else. And, um, but I was born there. 
But since around 2001, I had been going back and forth because I was involved with an art collective called Cheap in Berlin. And in 2001, we did a performance called Cheap Jewelry, which was a salute to the great legendary Carmen Miranda and the other legendary uh, figure, New York figure, Jack Smith. And so since then, with the formation of the Cheap Collective, I've been coming back and forth. And then with the, the situation in Los Angeles and, and the states getting dire in terms of uh, having affordable housing and health care and all that, I just decided to quietly just slink out of town in 2006 and without saying goodbye to anyone with no fanfare and nothing I just uh, moved to Berlin in 2006 where um, well in Los Angeles I got gentrified out of my beautiful gorgeous uh, 1920 streamlined modern apartment in Koreatown that I lived in for almost 20 years and I was really fortunate to have that apartment in Los Angeles because um, that landlady, she only rented to artists. And she didn't care if the apartment stayed uh, empty for two, three years. She wanted the right person to be living in the apartment. And uh, when her husband came down with Alzheimer's disease, then um, she sold the building of this awful carpet bagger, lauded. And all of us living in that apartment building were all put paying so below market that he just was going to do anything to get us out. And I had a, a friend of mine, her boyfriend was a legal aid lawyer, and he represented me, but he basically told me that, do you want your new job to be keeping this apartment when you're an artist? And I said, no, I, I, I'll just... So he made a deal with the landlord, and I was able to stay there like seven months rent-free. But um, I realized that Los Angeles was just not affordable any longer. And so I moved to Berlin, and I had an infrastructure there with a cheap collective. And I was able to get a, a cute little apartment in Rota Insel section of Berlin, which is the old uh, leftist uh, working class neighborhood of Schöneberg. And my, apartment, my rent is 200 euros a month which is, uh, I don't know what that translates to American dollars, but, um, and I also have uh, uh, heating, whereas a lot of times when you get cheap apartments in Berlin, it's the old-fashioned coal heating, but this one is, you just turn it on and it's warm. And uh, I have uh, Kunstler insurance, health insurance for artists, that I pay $70 a month for. So, and when I lived in the States, I didn't have any health insurance, so it's been really wonderful to be in Berlin in that regard. But uh, the other things about Berlin that can be a little trying is that the Germans are a little, they're known for their bluntness. <laughs> and um, at first I found the bluntness kind of amusing and fun, but then when you're engulfed in it on a daily basis, it, 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 it seems to uh, lose its uh, quaintness and uniqueness. <laughs> And then uh, I didn't know how to speak any German. Now, I've taken classes, so I know a little bit more uh, Deutsch now, but at the time when I moved there, I knew nothing. And so, um, and you really do, they say that you don't need any German living in, in, in Berlin and, and Germany, but that's a falsehood, that's a complete lie. You do need to learn German because people over, the young people all tend to know pretty good, have pretty good usage of English. But uh, anyone over 40 really doesn't, especially if they work in a department store, if they're a plumber, or people that you need to do things to get something done. You, you do need German. And then the art scene, the, it, they use the international language, which is English. It used to be years ago, French was the international language. Now that's, that's English. But... Um, so don't believe when people say that you don't need any uh, German to live in, in Berlin. You do. But uh, so that's why I've been in uh, Berlin for all these years. And I, I do like it some of the times. But then there's other times where 
because of the grayness, the perpetual grayness, and the the sort of like uh, um, sort of angry condition of some of the people, it can get to you. But I try to stay very optimistic and open and and try to like uh, be charming and up because it's, it's you're just going to make yourself even more depressed if you if you bring yourself down. I try to, to see a glass half uh, half uh, full as opposed to half empty. And and sometimes that works with some Germans, you know. And then there's others that it, it doesn't work at all. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, being a person of color, there's not so many black people in Berlin. So you are unique. <laughs> you notice that too when you're there. So you are somewhat unique and, and different. But uh, um, there is a there are Afro German, and there's the, uh, an Afro German community that sprung up, and they're becoming more vocal and more recognized in uh, Berlin. But uh, I hope that answered that question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Maybe if I can, it seems like there's a, a lot of influx back and forth between Berlin and, and uh, certainly New York. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of um, the homosexuals, uh, or I think they're, they're more currently known as the gays, um, like to travel to Berlin uh, quite a bit now. And I think it's, it's pictured as some kind of like sexual utopia. Um, can you talk about that in relationship to your own experience there? Well, I think that a lot of, uh, of, of the gays, or the homosexuals, that I, I, I like to always use that phrase, they go to Berlin thinking that, uh, well, they go there as sex tourists, some of them, exactly. looking for the, the proverbial giant German <laughs> petrification. <laughs> and... <laughs> Yes, there are a lot of Germans that do have extremely large genitalia, <laughs> but um, I found in, in, in my limited experience with that, is that some of the Germans' uh, uh, genitals, they may be very, very large if you are a size queen, but they're not always so pretty. <laughs> you know, they're not pretty to, the, for the sight and the, and, and the smell. and not, not all of them are always so pretty. You can't generalize. You can't always generalize that. But there are some that seem to be sort of like just large and lumpy. <laughs> you know, just their only purpose is just to collect moisture. <laughs> you know, and they tend to like either go off into the left or to the right in you know, sort of strange ways or sort of turn in and around and, you know but with some Americans that go there especially because the men are uh, uncircumcised they find that a delicacy <laughs> and it's unique and, 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 and different and, but uh, typically I find that the German men um, are very narrow of shoulder I like broad-shouldered men, like surfer boys with the broad, broad shoulders and tapered into the nice, tiny waves. And Germans tend to have, um, be very, very thin and very, very narrow-shouldered and pigeon-chested. And that's typically not the type of uh, man that I find attractive. But, you know, to each his own. Everybody has their own, you know, their own, their own thing. And... Um, my friend, the, the artist uh, Ron Avey, he always says with German sexuality, with male German sexuality, he always says that with Germans, they either want to just um, fist or cuddle. <laughs> and nothing, nothing in between fisting and cuddling. And, um, and I guess there's some truth in that. But I encourage you all to go to Berlin and just see for yourself. <laughs> you know? And when I first uh, moved there, I went to a lot of uh, clubs and parties. People recommended me. And it seems that like even the supermarket has like a dark room. Or a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> it's a supermarket. And, um, and I, I went to some sex uh, parties because we don't tend to have that so much of that anymore in the States. 
And when I went there, on one particular night at the, at the infamous laboratory club, I went there, and I didn't know that that particular night was fisting night. <laughs> and they have different nights, like there's shrimping night where people engage. If you, it's an old, uh, old school uh, black gay term, shrimping, from I think around the time of the Harlem Renaissance at uh, Buffet Flats. <laughs> and whatnot, that term came about where people would go into a, a party in Harlem and there'd be a, different rooms with various sexual proclivities going on. And it, sometimes there'd be like a, a heterosexual couple engaged in a sexual act or a lesbianic couple engaged or a homosexual couple engaged. And sometimes there'd be like little specific things such as sh shrimping, which means the licking and sucking of feet. And, um, so in Berlin, they have uh, shrimp nights, they have scat nights, they have urine nights, <laughs> they even have um, cabbage nights. <laughs> there is a, a fetish of uh, uh, individuals, certain individuals, who are uh, enamored of very attractive cabbage. <laughs> and they seek out the most uh, amazingly um, uh, attractive cabbage to engage in uh, a sexual interplay with said cabbage. <laughs> but uh, this particular night at uh, the uh, laboratory, it was fisting night, and so there was a... Hey, Paginal. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> there, there, there was a huge row of uh, fist bottoms, and over them were the fists tops. And so it was like an assembly line, an industrial <laughs> revolution assembly line of fisting. <laughs> and, and I was happy that, that this does exist here in Berlin, but to me it just seemed that it was a little bit void of any joy or elan. It was just sort of, it was just sort of, tonight is fisting night, <laughs> so I shall fist. <laughs> but that's just me, <laughs> and, and my particular take on that. So, you know, I really do encourage you to go to Berlin and just see for yourself and, you know, formulate your own opinion. You know, that's just, that's just my opinion. My humble opinion. Uh, Claire Dane's opinion. <laughs> <laughs> that seems very enchanted. Um, and so, the occasion of your return to um, America is a show uh, um, which was um, temporarily um, postponed because of the the hurricane, because of Sandra D. Um, I call it. I call the hurricane hurricane. Uh, one night, Sandy Duncan Week then. <laughs> That's really dating me, because none of you young people know who Sandy Duncan is. No one knows who Sandy They don't know, they don't know who Sandra D is either. That's yeah, true. Absolutely. Uh, can you talk about the show and maybe um, kind of... <laughs> I'm supposed to keep the the sure earrings that. because these I, I made these earrings myself and it's my little paintings. Yes. My little makeup paintings that I do, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I want to keep them facing the correct right. way, but they always just have a mind of their own and turning around. To the, but the other side's okay, too. <laughs> but um, uh, it's been sort of like two years in the, in the making, the, uh, my first major solo visual art exhibition. And um, I've been in a lot of group shows over the years, and, and most people are familiar with me as a performance artist. But uh, I don't think people are familiar with me as a visual artist, you know, and and um, and painter, and, um, and for the first time with this exhibit, doing a sculpture, sculpt, sculpture out of uh, bread, and uh, Leah Gangitana, the wonderful Leah Gangitana, over here. The gallerist, we have a, had a long, long relationship. Because Leah, she first brought me out to, she was a curator at Boston's ICA 
in the early 90s, and she brought me out for um, a really wonderful um, festival there. What was it called? Cross Dress Codes? Yes, sir. Dress Codes. And she brought me out, Kathy Opie. I think it was Kathy Opie's first big um, museum show, mm -hmm. was it? Yeah. Carmelita Tropicana. It was really wonderful. And, and then uh, Leah left Boston and then she worked as a curator at the, the infamous uh, Thread Waxing Space where I did a lot of shows there. And then she opened up her own not-for-profit gallery. Because Leah's like me, she's very old school. and we, She lives hand-to-mouth the way I do, <laughs> you know. And uh, she had said that she wanted me to do a solo show, and um, we started uh, doing the initial planning with uh, Leah and then also Jonathan Berger, mm -hmm. who I've been working with, and he does a production design on a lot of my um, commission pieces. Right. And he's like so gifted and so talented, Jonathan. And I met him when I was doing a little block seminar at Cal Arts, and he was just like a 19-year-old undergraduate then, and I loved his work. And we just sort of like started collaborating. Whenever I have uh, these brilliant students, somehow I start to like take control of their lives, and they take control of my life, and it's this kind of wonderful exchange and this continues and continues, and then he teaches now at NYU and up in Philadelphia. And so um, it's been quite a, a process of uh, putting this show together. And then when Hurricane Sandy, Duncan happened, I thought, oh no, it's not gonna, it's all that work and it, it's just not gonna happen because I, they put me in a cute little apartment in the East Village, in, in, right near Zone A. <laughs> 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 And I don't know how to swim. Most of us black girls can't swim. And so my fear is that the East River was going to overflow and connect with the Hudson River. And all of downtown would be awash and I would just sink. Because I can't waddle, I can't do anything. And so I was terrified. And I'd never been in a hurricane before. And it was just so frightening. And the lights went out and I can't handle being in the dark. I always sleep with the light on. And it was just really, really frightening. And so, and there was no power where I was in the gallery. The power was out, and it could have easily everything been flooded and no show. But the gallery was um, the the Armageddonous tendencies that I always see in everything didn't happen, and things had to be postponed. And it was a little inconvenient, but in comparison to what other people are still going through, it was nothing. You know, and the show happened five days later, and then uh, this little conversation also was moved. Right, we rescheduled as well. Rescheduled. So everything became A-OK. -okay. Absolutely. And I was really happy with uh, the exhibit, how it turned out, and the, the wonderful crowds of people, and, and also the Brent sculpture, which is like another collaborative uh, effort with wonderful Becerra Khan. Who's so beautiful and so gorgeous and talented, and and she goes to Cornell. She's a Cornell student, and um, Becerra and with Leah Becerra, Jonathan, and all the other wonderful young children. Because <laughs> I'm so old, everybody's a child to me, because I'm ancient. Um, at the participant uh, incorporated gallery, helping and. Um, I was able to go down to this wonderful Grand Daisy Bakery and uh, use the dough and sculpt with Becerra. And uh, Becerra and Leah had did a test because I sent them the drawing of what I wanted the sculpture to look like a month ago. And they did a test and then they sent me the pictures and I couldn't believe it. Because it was just an ideal. I said, I want bread sculpture, giant totemic bread sculpture, <laughs> Venus of Willendorf. <laughs> and, um, but I didn't know if, because I'm not really a, a sculptress, <laughs> so I didn't know if it would work or not, but uh, it really came out pretty uh, good, and I was really happy with the results, and so, you know, if you get a chance, go by the gallery, it's Wednesday through Sunday, 12 to 7, and, and go see for yourself, you know. Uh, because with me, I always feel that even if something is a failure, failure edit. That's fine too. 
because you know I lear <laughs> you learn so much from your failures. So I embrace failure edits and and my failures. I embrace that too. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, the show is called Hag. Can it's you, called can you tell us about Hag, small contemporary haggard, and it sort of <laughs> references um, a home gallery that I had in the 80s, the last century. <laughs> we're, both, yeah. we're both beings of a different century, era, yeah. a different era. And um, I, I started this gallery because I lived at that time on, in, this, in this apartment building called La Via Rosa, which was on the Sunset Strip, the beginning of the Sunset Strip. And the walls of this apartment, it was a very small apartment, but the walls were so big and, 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 and unusually formed. And at that time, I felt so displaced because when you're sort of uh, intersects the way I am, sort of between, there's gay here, there's straight here, and then I'm somewhere. I, I never felt like I fit in into anywhere. And at that time, when I was quite young, I was realizing that I never was involved in any relationships. I never had a boyfriend. And I was attracted to men, even though I don't tend to get along so well with men. I think I, I, think I really should just be a lesbian, because I don't find myself having um, much in common with men, other than the fact that I like them for sex. But I, I wouldn't want to live with a man. I think after the sex, I want them gone. <laughs> You know, and, and, and growing up in an all-feminine household with uh, my mother and my, um, my sisters, and being the, the baby of the family, there were never any men in my, in my, uh, in my, in my household. You know, men were not allowed. And my mother sort of, sort of lived a sort of uh, lesbian separatist, uh, <laughs> feminist life. She was sort of like a, sort of like a queen bee Thim top, you know, <laughs> with ruling a bevy of these butch lesbian bottoms. <laughs> you know, and, and nowadays there's so many, there, there, there's not so many proper butches anymore because they all go, go F to M. <laughs> but, it, but, in my, it, but in my mother's day, there were all these wonderful uncles that I had, these lesbian uncles. Bulldaggers. Hot, juicy bulldaggers. And um, they went by the names of Tiger and Spider, <laughs> and uh, they had all these wonderful names, and they could build you anything. And since I was poor, uh, all my lesbian uncles, they built my toys for me. They made the toys, and they built just anything that you asked. They had their tools ready. <laughs> And um, my mother sort of ruled as this. My mother always wore jewelry, gloves, hat. She did housework in high heels. She was the ultimate femme, 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 femme. But she was a femme top. And she never spoke louder than a whisper. But she commanded such feminine authority and power, my mother. And she never had to raise her, her voice to anyone. She just gave them a look. <laughs> <laughs> and she got her way. Yep. <laughs> Just a look, you know. And everyone in our neighborhood in South Central LA, because my mother, she's originally from Louisiana, a Creole, a black Creole, um, Choctaw Indian woman. And like a, a lot of blacks of her generation, during the Great Migration, they left the South to go to the North or to the West. And so my mother left Louisiana, and she wound up, she was a sharecropper's daughter. And she wound up in Southern California. First she had a stint in Oregon, but then she came to Los Angeles in 1945. And because of these, uh, these uh, covenant laws that Los Angeles had, it's almost like the Deep South in a way, Los Angeles is very preju prejudiced. Um, these, these covenant laws, black people could only live in certain areas. And one of those areas was Watts. And so that's the area that uh, my family lived in was in, in Watts. And um, so that's a little bit of the history of my mother. And my mother was married to my sister's father, but um, she wasn't married to my father. My mother had a, an affair with, a, she was working as a domestic worker 
for a very wealthy uh, um, uh, Hudia, a uh, Jewish family. And um, she, she connected with one of the relatives of this uh, family from Mexico. Originally they were from Mexico City. And um, she connected with one of their relatives who was visiting, who was like around 19 or 20 years old. And my mother was like 46. And she was really into jazz. And this young man was really, really into jazz. And they went to a Ray Charles concert, and something happened during that concert because nine months later, I was the ripper around the world. I was, I was born. And it was really, really scandalous at that time for, because my mother is sort of like maybe Oprah Winfrey's coloring. Mm -hmm. And um, when I, and, and my father is uh, Mexican, German, Udia, Jewish. And, um, and his family had left Germany when the Nazis came to power, and they were um, Germans who had married Jewish women, and so they moved to, um, to Mexico. And there's a very large uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, community in Mexico City, still is. And um, so um, I have this strange mixture, this strange background between Black Creole and uh, Choctaw Indian, with my grandmother having lived on a reservation, and then my father being German, Mexican, and Jewish. And so, of course, I'm not Jewish, because that's a matriarchal society, so if your mother's Jewish, then you're Jewish. But, um, um, oh, I lost my thought. What was I saying? <laughs> See, when you have junior Alzheimer's, you forget. You forget everything. But, um... The topic of hag and the oh, hag oh, gallery. Oh, the hag, <laughs> how I started the hag gallery. So, um, not fitting in and feeling that I could never get a relationship, um, I decided, well, why don't I turn my apartment into an art gallery and every six weeks I'll have these shows and maybe, because I didn't like going to bars and whatnot, and I thought, maybe I'll meet some interesting fella at my openings. And so that's what I did. And that's how the Hag Gallery was created. And at that time, I knew a lot of people who made art, but didn't really consider themselves artists. They just, like, made things. And, and that was sort of, like, my criteria was that you didn't really consider yourself an artist. And you just made things and didn't go to art school or anything. And so um, I started uh, Hag, but the ulterior motive was to get a boyfriend. <laughs> but of course, like a lot of things with me, that didn't uh, pan out. I, I never got a boyfriend. Everybody else who came to the gallery <laughs> met their uh, lesbians, got there, met their girlfriend, uh, gays met their boyfriend, hetero couples met their significant other. Everybody else connected sexually and socially, but except me. So as the hostess, you never get anything. And that's been sort of like the... That's been sort of like the story of my life, you know? So I guess I'm just not meant to be partnered with anyone, you know, because after all these years, 30 odd years, and, you know, the occasional, I get the occasional dalliance here and there, but nothing steady well, <laughs> or regular. Life is young and there's a room full of people, so you really, you know, hope springs eternal. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> But uh, that's how Hag started, and uh, the, the name Hag sort of referred to this sort of subset with the sort of emerging queer core, where we were reclaiming that term Hag, and that it's good to be a Hag. It's good to be, you know, uh, what is considered not, uh, uh, when people say, oh, that Hag, I want to be a Hag. <laughs> and um, there was this, uh, this uh, teacher from the, um, the fashion school, um, Madame Ricky, from Studio Berceau in Paris. And I had met her in the 80s when I was um, doing some performances with uh, uh, Lisa Suckdog and Costas. Uh, or was this before Lisa Suckdog? I can't remember the, the time just zero. But um, she kind of considered herself a hag, and she worked that hagness. And uh, she was like a big inspiration for this whole hag movement, Madame Ricky of, us, of Studio Berceau. And that's where the name came from, hag, small, contemporary, haggard. So that's the tie-in to um, 
The only difference with the, the hag gallery that I've created inside of Participant is that it's my work, whereas when I did it originally in the 80s, I was uh, championing other people's, mm -hmm. other people's work. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you talk about, so you've moved from, um, from performance, and you were talking briefly about your, your origins, your relationship to L.A. and its punk scene and queer core. And so now you're, you're doing paintings and visual work. How does the, the more recent stuff that's on display now relate to your larger body of work, your oeuvre? My oeuvre? Well, um... Obra, in Spanish. Oh! Uh, I'm Espanol. Um, uh, well, for, well, for me, my... Um, everything relates and everything is um, part of... Uh, ascendancy with with what I do and it also even involves like reusing things constantly recycling props that I've made in shows um, reusing uh, text from one show to the next um, sometimes imagery uh, uh, sound um, like with the hag uh, exhibition that's a participant now, there's like a soundtrack that goes with the exhibition. And there are little elements in the soundtrack when you go to see it that I've used for like my commission piece that was uh, uh, earlier in the year for in Los Angeles for the Getty Pacific Standard Time, West of Rome, Public Art. Um, I used um, some things from that in um, the HAG exhibition. And also some things from uh, when I did a piece, a commission piece at MOCA in Los Angeles, the Dejecta piece that I did, that, and Jonathan was the production designer, I used some text in Korean and Spanish, and I brought that again as part of um, the hat piece. And then also um, this collaboration with one of my cheap colleague in uh, Susanna Zatza, there's some um, sound, there's some uh, music, there's some things that are in this piece called The Communist Bigamist that's also in Hag exhibition. So it's reusing things, getting a lot of use out of things, and, but doing it a little bit different each time, and um, uh, being almost self-referential and whatnot. So that's one way that, um, and even the, 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 the title for tonight's uh, little conversation, um, uh, no One Leaves Delilah, I was in a group show at Invisible Exports mm -hmm. Gallery um, earlier in the year, and that, that group show with uh, John Waters and Genesis Peorich, it was, it was called um, Notes on Notes on Camp, but my section with my makeup paintings was called No One Leaves Delilah, and then you came up with a little addition for tonight of having rap on race. Mm -hmm. Which I love because when I think of rap, W-R-A-P, I think of, that's not a rap, it's a burrito. But you don't want to say burrito, but it's a burrito. Exactly. That's true. The burrito gets lost. That's true. And I hate that burrito gets lost. It shouldn't. It really should. Could I ask you about a performance you did? in New York in the, in the 90s, where mm -hmm. you came out in white face and marine drag uh, at the squeeze box. And I oh, wondered oh. what that was, a statement on, on masculinity or, or what? Oh, that was with my, um, my, my, my art band, Pedro, Mira, and Esther, and, uh, P, or PME for short. And that, um, that band and the, 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 the performance it, we, with that band, I went through a lot of different changes with that band. And for that particular show at Squeezebox, I wanted to do um, a sort of take on the angry white male. And my actual birth name is Clarence. So I became this white uh, supremacist from Idaho, this militia man named Clarence. And I had like a ZZ Top beard. <laughs> and... Um, I painted my face to somewhat resemble a sort of Caucasoid <laughs> look and wearing all military fatigue 
legs and whatnot. And so, I, so when the, the, the performance uh, starts, I'm Clarence, the militia man, the sexist militia man. And then as the performance continues and the songs continue, I start morphing back into my original uh, persona of being Vaginal Davis, the woman trapped in the body, of, a woman trapped in the body of a woman. So the, my voice is like all deep and masculine in the performance. And it, then it goes back to my normal voice, which is more or less this. <laughs> and, I, and then I start getting, I start becoming more feminized. And at the very end, um, I take off the male drag, and then like, someone pops a wig on me, and I sing the last song, which is Hot Sexy. D, hot sexy dominatrix, and then I'm back to the old vaginal of yore that people know. Because everything that I've done since um, since my my first sort of uh, uh, performative uh, art band, which was the Afro Sisters in the 80s, everything deals with issues, and Cholita the female menudo, Black Fag with Bibi Hansen, they all deal with issues of race. But I try to do things, I don't know if I'm always successful or not, but I try to do things in a sort of non-dogmatic way, to sort of do it in a sort of whimsical way. And um, that's just my approach. But everything always stems back to racial and class issues, being that I was born, you know, really, really, you know, poor and living in the projects and you know our projects in, in Los Angeles aren't like East Coast projects they're you know it's sunny and warm all the time in Los Angeles <laughs> you don't have the same kind of hardships you know but we my family grew up in the, the projects the Jordan Down projects in Watts and also the Ramona Gardens projects in East Los Angeles which actually was a very um, interesting project house because it was designed by the famous architect Lloyd Frank Wright and Schindler and Neutra. And this is like utopian housing for the poor back in the 1930s, you know, which is, you know, quite interesting. But uh, there's always this commentary on race, but it's in a, in, a, in, a, in a whimsical like manner, not didactic, not dogmatic, you know, because I think you sort of like, people stop listening if you get to be too shrill, they just stop listening. And you want to get them to somewhat listen. Mm -hmm. So I've always tried to like have these ways of getting people to listen and by doing my work in a different kind of uh, way and sort of killing them with kindness. But it doesn't mean that I'm not as, you know, growing up, <laughs> growing up the way I grew up, poor li living in Los Angeles, I'm still very, very angry. <laughs> and that it, it, it shows in the work. And some people get it, some people don't. And, you know, and also there's a certain kind of violence to me, you know. And also uh, m my mother had this because one of my earliest memories with my mother um, was downtown Los Angeles in the, in the 60s and we were waiting for a bus and we were about to, to catch the bus back to the projects and some red-faced, mean-looking man who was intoxicated came up to my mother and he's, he started yelling at her and saying, you ugly nigger bitch. And my mother being, you know, you know, she never raised her voice. She, she had this really soft, soft, she never spoke hot, louder than a whisper. And she just hurt, but her anger took over, and she just went, she blanked out. And, and I'm holding her hand, and my mother, who's only five feet, feet tall, she's quite small and petite, and this man was at least, I think, about well, six feet four. He was very big. And we were standing at the bus stop, and behind us was the big, uh, I think it was the, the May Company or Broadway department store. They have the Christmas display. And somehow my little tiny mother pushed this giant man into the window display. And all the glass <laughs> broke. And people are rushing about this man's in this glass. And she just calmly, the bus came, and she just walked on the bus, and she acted like nothing happened. <laughs> and I'll always remember that image of my mother doing that. You know, and she never even mentioned it when we got back home and, 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 and my, my sisters. 
who back then in the 60s, they were my, my older sisters were, um, well, I had one sister who was already grown when I was born, and then my other sisters were teenagers in the 60s, and she never even mentioned to them that she had done that. And in a way, I kind of like, did I dream it? Did, she, did it really happen? Or is it just like one of those childhood memories that, but I do believe it did, it actually, it did happen. So, when you, you know, when you grow up in Los Angeles, which is one of the, the most segregated cities, you know, it's almost like it is the deep south L.A. And people see it as only just this Hollywood image, the Hollywood facade of L.A. But there's other little layers that you peel back in L.A. that's not so... The underbelly. Uh, the underbelly, so to speak, of Los Angeles. Absolutely. You know, and because so many people come from everywhere, God knows where land, with the hopes and, and dreams of becoming something in the entertainment complex of being something. We all can't be something. We can't all be rock stars and, and, and film stars, but they come there with that same retarded dream. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but here I am, uh, born in Los Angeles. When you're born there, you see through it. And I couldn't wait to leave and get out. It's like, what took me so long? I, I, I should have like left Los Angeles back in the 80s. But when my mother, my mother didn't die to 2000, and I really couldn't leave, I'm so tied to my mother, that I couldn't really leave Los Angeles until after my mother died. You know, so when she died of cancer in 2000, then I felt like I could really escape. And I sort of followed Louise Brooks trajectory <laughs> to bring me to Berlin, Germany. And, um, you know, Germany's so talked about now, it's all hype. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> it's, you have to see it for yourself, but I find it all just hype. But it's really strange that uh, people have more of an appreciation after you leave your own country and you go somewhere else, then suddenly they like see you in a different light, you know. But you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And the last time I was here in New York was when I won the uh, at the Eichelberger Award for for doing the piece at uh, uh, Performance Space uh, One Twenty Two. PS One. PS 122, and uh, so I still love coming to New York, but New York is so different, and it's, mm. it's so changed, you know, and I remember coming here in the, in the 80s when uh, one of my mentors was, and, and Jim Fratt, you probably remember um, Mommy, um, George Byron, yes. from ACT UP yes. days, and um, he was one of my mentors. He was a model in the 70s, and then um, after he got too old to model, he became a high fashion stylist, mom, and designer of uh, accessory lines. And he mentored not only me, but a lot of queens. Bradley Picklesheimer, there was tons of queens that he mentored. And I just thought his life was so glamorous because he, he lived in an apartment with a doorman. <laughs> and so when I come to, to New York, I stay with him, and if I want to mail a letter out to someone, the door, I just give it, he said, oh, give it to the doorman, he'll mail it for you. And to me, it's like, oh my God, it's so glamorous. And in his building, him and his, his hot um, uh, Jewish lover, um, they, uh, in their building, um, Richard Gere lived in their building, and Penelope, remember when Richard Gere was married to Penelope Medford, mm -hmm. who was in Coming Home, that mm -hmm. film with uh, Jane Fonda and John Voight, and she got nominated for an Academy Award, and then her career just disappeared. She's you know? around. She's still around? Yeah. yeah oh, around. I always wonder what happened there. She's on a fracking, <laughs> she's on a fracking demonstration with me. Oh! <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, George Byron, mommy, he died of, of AIDS, and, 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 and but he was such a influence on me and a, and, a, and a mentor and he knew everyone so when I was doing my my, my zine for Latoya, Latoya Jackson magazine he made sure that everyone saw that zine he got copies to everyone and you know um, in those days to get like uh, people would write about something if it was really interesting whereas now if you don't have a power of publicists and money behind you you can't get any press you know, but but back then, you know, um, I feel sorry for the for the children now because to try to like get any kind of uh, press attention, it's it's really really difficult for the children. But back then, if you were just kind of unique and different, and my Fertile Toya Jackson magazine was so it was just Xerox publication, 
you know, my day job was at UCLA's Placement and Career Planning Center, you know, working in the, at the Placement Center. My boss was Heather Locklear's father, Bill Locklear. <laughs> <laughs> so I had access to a free Xerox machine. That's where my zine came from, because I had some, a free, and I just made as many copies as I got orders from, I would make, you know? And so that's why uh, one issue of Fertile could last for years. <laughs> Because then I would just go in on Saturday, I had the keys, so I'd go in on, on the weekend on Saturday, and I just would Xerox as many copies and staple it, and, you know, that was my grant. <laughs> my day job at UCLA was a, was an artist grant. <laughs> or I, I saw it that way, is that it was like having an artist grant, because, you know, I, I never got any grants, you know. I didn't even, I, the only time I've ever won anything in uh, was at the Archibald Award. That's the first time I ever won anything or got like an art grant thing. I get them in, in, in Europe, but uh, here I never got anything, you know, but except for the Ethel Eichelberger Award, which is really wonderful. <laughs> you know, because I'm not, most of the ones that have won that were all people based in New York. I've never lived in New York. I've done shows here over the many centuries. <laughs> but, I, you know, I've never lived here, you know. And I, I, I love New York, but it's, it was always, just, to me, it just felt so expensive, like, like London. And L.A. was always the, the, the most inexpensive of all the major cities. Not anymore. Now it's, Berlin is still cheaper than, than other cities, but uh, if I moved to Berlin now, I wouldn't be able to afford to live there. I wouldn't have an apartment so cheap. And my rent is actually going up from 200 euros a month to, in January it's going to go up to 216. Oh. But I have an old contract and with the Germans they worship and have orgasms over paperwork. <laughs> and if you have an old contract everything is geared to renters not to property owners there. You know that throwback to having a more socialistic more you know and um, having a social conscious too a little bit more of a social conscious and um, thank goodness, because, oh, I would not want, you know, at my age, to live communally. I'm a little hard to get along with, because it's hard, it's hard to be friends with me.